for those that don't quite make the cut, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be a fit for a future role. So I do tell people that if you don't get hired, always ask the person who interviewed you, could you give me some constructive feedback? A lot of us are scared to do that. We don't want to hear what we do wrong because we just don't like to hear it. But that's going to stunt your growth. If you know what you did wrong in an interview or what gaps you need filled, hearing that information is really just going to make you a better person and uh, make you a better qualified candidate for the next time you're up. Welcome to Security Cleared Jobs. Who's hiring and how? The podcast for cleared professionals looking for new opportunities and career advice. We go behind the scenes with recruiters and hiring managers from leading cleared employers to uncover the information you need to make a smart career move. Get ready for insights from this week's guest and your hosts, Kathleen Smith and Rachel Bozeman. Well, hello and welcome all of you dear listeners. This is Rachel, and today we have a double special treat. The first part of our special treat is I get the distinct pleasure of hosting with the one and only Bob Wheeler. Yes, you've heard the name. You may have heard it from Military Monday webinars. You may have heard it from his extensive career in the Navy or as an instructor. Or heck, he's also at clearedjobs.net as an account manager. And there's so much more, but we also have a guest we want to get to, so we'll stop talking about Bob. Bob, welcome! Hey, thanks, Rachel. I am so excited to be here. This is really a a great opportunity to be with you guys. I'm looking forward to today's show. Today, we have uh, Chad Clary. He's a senior program manager with V2X. Chad is also a fellow Navy veteran, just like myself. So anchors away, welcome aboard. Chad Clary arriving, whatever you want to say. Welcome to the podcast, Chad. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Rachel. I'm happy to be here and uh, good to see another Navy veteran online. Awesome. Yes, so much good stuff to talk about. But before we dig into all of the goodness, we like to kind of start with you, Chad, and start at the very beginning and tell us just a little bit about your career and how you landed at V2X. Sure. My career really started with the U.S. Navy. I joined to see a little bit of the world, serve the country, and really get paid education. Uh, So I was able to do all three. I only did one enlistment as an IT. Before I got out, I worked alongside a gentleman while I was deployed on an aircraft carrier. And he came from the fleet systems engineering team. And anytime we had a technical issue, a SATCOM system went down, we had a complex network issue, he was able to point us in the right direction and help us solve it. So I kind of wanted to do something like that. You know, he told me, send me your resume. Uh, I actually sent it to him or his company. And I don't think I even got a call back. And that was kind of expected because I was vanilla. I didn't have a lot of education or certifications at the time. Uh, So I started working with this other company. And as luck would have it, I actually ended up started training a lot of people from the fleet systems engineering team as I traveled the globe and taught how to manage and troubleshoot networks on military installations. 2014, I got my start with V2X. I started as a RF engineer in Bahrain. After about five years there, I got tired of the desert, decided to take a job under the same program in Naples, Italy. And then nine months after getting to Italy, I went back to Bahrain to be the site lead. Two years later, came back here to San Diego, and I am now the senior program manager of the fleet systems engineering team. So very fun and fast paced uh, environment I've worked in. And I went from not even being qualified to the program manager of the same program. You know, my career has kind of been full circle. So very exciting to be a part of this program still. Man, that's a great, great story, Chad. That's a, it's, it's always interesting to hear the way people talk about their transition because no transition is ever really the same, I don't think, but it's always got a lot of similarities of the successful ones, at least. Uh, so congrats on that. And thanks for sharing that story with us. Now that you're at V2X, so talking a little bit about that, the, the V2X is a pretty big company. You guys got like 14,000 employees. What is it that V2X does in the cleared community, like just in general? Like what's the main focus of the organization as a whole before we start getting into the, the more details? Uh, It's actually nearing roughly 16,000 employees now. Oh, wow. And uh, last year we became V2X. Uh, It's actually a combination of Vectris, uh, which is the company I worked for, and Vertex, uh, which dealt with a lot of aerospace. So they picked up divisions of Raytheon and Vectris uh, had a big footprint in base operations, logistics, supply chain, and IT primarily. We have three business units, advanced technology, global mission training and sustainment, and aerospace. And we have plenty of opportunities under each of those business units for the cleared community. 
So speaking of all of those opportunities, you know, the million dollar question, what are the type of positions or kind of the skill sets that you're really honing into? And what are you overall hiring for? There's actually something for everyone, you know, with 16,000 employees, many of them being cleared positions under each of our business units, we probably have something that anyone could really apply to. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Under advanced technology alone, we operate the world's largest combat network. So we have SharePoint developers, cybersecurity analysts, project managers, uh, all working out in Kuwait, Qatar, Jordan, Bahrain, uh, all around the Middle East. And then if you want to ride a ship, you want to join an aircraft carrier on deployment. We have people right now on about six or seven ships deployed around the world with the military. They eat, sleep, and work on the ship 24-7. Those guys are actually part of my fleet systems engineering team. They do RF, network, and systems engineering and our motto is keyboard to antenna. We fix pretty much anything on the comm side. Uh, with global mission training and sustainment, we do a lot of the logistics and uh, supply chain. And you don't really think of clear jobs being in that arena, but for like wastewater treatment facilities or postal clerks, you might need at least a public trust. Uh, and then we also have positions for painters or machinists. Uh, you know, if you look at our career portal, go v2x.com slash careers, a lot of those postings will actually say that you'll require a secret clearance within one year of hire. And then under the third business unit, aerospace, we do a lot of cool stuff with aircraft modification, modernization, fabrication of parts on site. We do a lot with predictive analytics and uh, maintenance to improve our aircraft and ground fleet that we support. So plenty of opportunities out there really depends on the program, the location, and uh, what the person's really looking for. Yeah, it sounds like you've got tons of opportunities and sounds like they're all over the place. So give us just a little bit more detail on where these positions might be located because it sounds like you might be a little international. We are. So uh, we're currently spanning 45 countries. Some programs span multiple countries. On the FSET program, we have people working in seven different time zones across 13 different states, territories, and countries. And that's just on a program with about 100 engineers. Uh, so we have a pretty big Mideast footprint. Uh, we have a few programs in Europe, uh, whether that's Italy or Germany, Turkey. We have a small footprint in Japan. We are in the Marshall Islands, CONUS. Uh, again, it really depends on the program that you're supporting, but we're pretty much everywhere. Man, that is that is really impressive to, to see all of those different places. Something else that we know, Chad, when we look at some of the openings that V2X has I think more than half of them are requiring a secret clearance. One of those clearance levels that a lot of people tend to have. I got to imagine that if it's a clearance that there's a good number of people that have that clearance, the competition has got to be pretty stiff for some of those positions at that point because lots of people have the clearance too. Any tips on how you can stand out besides just saying, oh, I've got a secret clearance. What other kind of things should a job seeker be able to do to really stand out for some of those positions? This is really up to the candidate. I would say don't ever let yourself or your resume be the reason that you don't get your foot in the door. Of course, the market for secret clearances is much more competitive because it's kind of the base entry point for having a clearance. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone that applies to a secret level job qualifies for that job. It really depends. Some jobs are very specialized. So those who have experience in those areas uh, are not going to have as much difficulty trying to find the job, but it also makes it a little more challenging for us to find the right candidate. But for the more generic roles, let's say for system administrators, where they might be a dime a dozen, for your listeners, you want to make sure you include all relevant work experience in your resume. And I would say don't let it read like a military evaluation. I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. I've seen a resume that says, you know, I led a team of 10 service members uh, overseeing a network of 100 virtualized servers. You know, that doesn't really do much for us. What we need you to do is kind of list the hardware, the systems, the software that you've worked on, if it's like an IT role, and be prepared to speak to everything you put in your resume. If you put something in there because you think it sounds cool, you better be ready to talk about it because we're going to ask you. And some of us might not have time or money to enroll in college. If you know that that position requires a degree or requires a specific certification, do everything that you can prior to uh, looking for that next career step to prepare yourself the ball's really in your court. And then when you get to the interview, you know, smile, don't be self-criticizing and just be prepared to discuss mistakes you've made, maybe some of the accomplishments you've had, and then what you've learned from those mistakes. Fantastic advice. It is. It's so important. What you put out there, you're going to be asked about. So be able to speak to it with a sense of integrity behind everything that you put out there. But something I want to kind of pivot just a little bit from all of the great advice. I want to get some more advice, but a little bit in a different arena here. So something that you mentioned was just kind of the Oconus positions that might be available. Not everyone's always considered that. Maybe some have wanted to stay within the continental US, but kind of thinking, hey, maybe that is something I want to consider. 
Can you tell us who succeeds in those type of opportunities and who maybe isn't it a good fit for? Great question. I cannot say that I've observed too many folks go to an OCONUS position and really fail. I would say that if you're considering going overseas, make sure your affairs are in order before you leave. You know, if you have stuff in three different storage places, make sure you're ready to go. Before you depart, make sure that you understand the contents of your offer letter from salary to benefits. Ask a lot of questions. If you're not asking the hiring manager about what type of team you're going to be joining, what your customer is expecting, and things like that, then we might be a little concerned because we expect those questions to come in. More importantly, I would say when you arrive, do everything that you can to become a contributing member of that team. Find the things that no one else wants to do that are required and excel in those areas. You know, your team's going to really appreciate that. And then you're really going to open up more opportunities for yourself. People with families, you know, children in high school, that that might be something that's more challenging for them. Uh, A lot of our overseas opportunity might allow for dependents to join them. They might pay for tuition. So those are the types of questions you'd want to ask as well. Just because you're going overseas doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go by yourself. In the cases that you do, then, uh, you know, you can always talk to other people about how they handle those types of situations. No, that's some great advice and uh, very needed when people are looking at some of those uh, OCONUS opportunity type things. Something else that you had talked about, Chad, was uh, that B2X has such a, a big emphasis on employees with soft skills. Can you help our listeners understand a little bit the difference between the hard skills and the soft skills and why B2X puts a, a priority on good soft skills as well? We have a seemingly bottomless supply of technical folks who excel in engineering or fixing extremely difficult problems. Uh, Those hard skills, learning how to rebuild an aircraft engine or uh, fix a complex IP multicast issue that's spanning the globe. uh, Those are things that we need. We need people that are interested in doing that work, people that want to do that work and that possess those hard skills. Uh, But what happens when uh, someone like that is called upon to take a more leadership role? Uh, Are they ready? Uh, Do they know how to communicate? Do they know how to carry themselves as a leader? You know, are they leaders within their own team? How do they manage their time? How do they build relationships with a customer? Uh, Those are the soft skills that we're trying to develop. We cannot assume that everyone automatically joins our workforce and knows how to interact with each other. So it's really up to us to set that standard. Uh, We want to educate and coach our personnel on how to treat people with dignity and respect, uh, how to communicate with purpose, and then really how to develop as leaders. Uh, We have plenty of internships or leadership tracks within our company where we really stress these soft skills. Uh, Recently, we had our executive director of HR fly out to Bahrain and provide leadership training to 20 personnel. And a lot of them weren't even first-line supervisors. You know, they were trying to teach them leadership traits, how to prevent toxicity in the workplace. So, you know, the last thing our company wants is For someone that comes from outside the company who doesn't understand our organizational culture, uh, they don't understand our cultural imperatives of agility, accountability, and engagement. They don't don't understand our mission or our customer. Uh, Leading the team, uh, because if they're not aligned, uh, then they might set us in the wrong direction. Uh, That's not to dissuade any of your listeners from applying. Uh, We want you to apply. We want you to join our team. It's really to say that once you're a part of this organization, uh, you become a part of that strategy. And we definitely concentrate on helping you develop as a person as we grow and develop as an organization. Mm, That's very cool. I love that concept of joining, but getting to immediately be part of the strategy. That's a really, really cool concept. I've never thought of it that way. So look at that, Chad, just opening new conversations up. Appreciate that so very much. Something else that you shared in the pre-call that I think was pretty stinking amazing uh, was that you shared that V2X is a company where we understand that diversity is something that really should be celebrated. Tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that statement. And then I know what the listeners really want to hear. They're going to want to hear more about that culture. I actually just watched a movie, I think two weekends ago, called A Million Miles Away. Have either of you seen it? No, but I'm writing it down now. I have not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, uh, it's about a Mexican-American astronaut, Jose Hernandez. And, uh, you know, he comes from a very humble background. His uh, family are migrants and Uh, He starts working, works really hard on education, starts working with some other engineers. And there's one scene specifically where, you know, I think his coworkers go out on a lunch break or something like that. And he takes that time to fix a very difficult problem that they've all been challenged with and they, they couldn't fix it. They return from lunch and you see that all of his coworkers look the same. They dress the same, probably come from the same educational background 
probably learned how to troubleshoot the same way. And they just look mystified when he's the one that said, I, I, I was able to solve this problem. Uh, I think it paints a very good picture, although it was theatrical and probably dramatized somewhat, uh, of what diversity brings. You know, you want to work in an environment where diversity is celebrated and embraced, but we're able to treat each other with respect. You know, we respect each other's different viewpoints. Uh, when you can foster that type of environment, you're really inciting creativity and innovation to really solve your customers' problems. For our customers, uh, we think about who our customers are and what they want to see. The U.S. military, the DOD, is, is one of our biggest and most important customers. Uh, if you think about the U.S. military, it's probably one of the most diverse organizations in the entire world. You have people from all different types of educational backgrounds, race, sex, you know, whatever type of background they come from, working together toward a common goal. So, you know, with our company, we want to make sure that the diversity that we have enables us to better understand our customers uh, while allowing the knowledge and skill sets of our employees to really make a difference. Our company, you know, V2X does not care about your exterior, uh, your pedigree, or any of those superficial traits. Uh, we do care about who you are as a person. Do you have a desire to get things done? Do you want to be excited to come to work every day? Those are the types of people that we're looking for. Uh, we have different employee resource groups to really kind of drive home that there are people out there that share similar backgrounds, whether it's a, a women's group or a veterans group, allies of pride, things like that. And then just from top leadership on down, place a very strong emphasis on on the diversity of the company. Beautiful. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm glad that you brought up, the you know, how diverse also the military is. I can see how that would really play into the fact that you guys have got a tremendous amount of veterans at V2X. I think like 40% of your employees or something like that are veterans. So that's that's congrats on that big number, particularly when it's 40% of like 16,000 people. Yeah, that's that's even better. I think you guys are doing some pretty good stuff with the SkillBridge program there, Chad. You know, are, are you having some success with SkillBridge? Uh, absolutely. And thank you. seems like every month I log into LinkedIn, I see that V2X has been awarded a top company for veterans. I think last week we got one from Fair360 or for our DE&I program. So we take pride in that. But for SkillBridge, we've had a lot of success in the very short history that we've had the program. Uh, I need to get a quick shout out to my assistant program manager, Chris Denny. Uh, he's been running SkillBridge for us, uh, for my portfolio, but he also is kind of the belly button for the company. I've seen him send out the kind of foundational groundwork uh, to other programs and different business units to get this up and running. But we've actually been able to hire one of our recent SkillBridge interns who retired from the military as an officer, and he transitioned straight into an engineering role out in Bahrain. We had another intern start last Monday. He flew off the Gerald R. Ford, which is currently deployed in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And he flew off and joined our team. He's on the Norfolk waterfront today, uh, side by side with our team, learning how to do the job. So it's an excellent program. You know, officers enlisted can both take advantage of it. And it's a great way for the customer to get a little bit of extra work out of us. It's good for us to see the candidate and really great experience for service members to see what it's like on the other side. Uh, so for those who may be listening, it's a great program. Just reach out to me uh, if you have any interest and uh, I would be glad to connect you to our uh, SkillBridge coordinator. That's terrific. I love it. And hearing a little bit about that, I think you bring something kind of unique to this conversation that we don't always get to delve in, which is as a hiring manager. So not only do we get to hear your perspective as a hiring manager, but I am most impressed that you got to work the word belly button into the conversation. <laughs> so kudos on that. Uh, but really <laughs> looking at the lens from the hiring manager chair, you know, it's interesting for our listeners that are, you know, always working with the recruiters and kind of that front end into an organization. But hearing from the hiring manager, you work with the recruiting team. So it would be kind of nice to reverse engineer this a little bit and hear exactly how you get to work with the hiring team and what any recommendations you might have to a candidate on how they can best engage through that. I work with a great recruiting and talent acquisition team on a weekly basis. Uh, we have a call where we discuss different roles that we need filled, uh, onboarding status of current candidates, talk about different benefits packages for different positions, so on and so forth. And we kind of work together that way. They do a lot of the background stuff, do a lot of the sourcing. And when they send us a resume and it's for a candidate that we think really fits what we need, we will reach out to that candidate directly. On my specific programs, uh, I might send that to a site lead or to the site supervisor, and then I'll let them uh, handle the interview because they're going to be working for that person typically. And they'll bring in their team of technical SMEs, and they'll do kind of a round robin, 
and we'll kind of peruse the resume, ask you questions about what you've listed there, talk about the job description, try to see where there's some overlap, where you might be challenged if you, you know, joined and didn't know something, you know, we'd be able to help drive toward pairing you up with someone as a mentor, uh, things like that. And then once we find a candidate and, uh, you know, they're going to be a great fit, we typically will reach out to them again and discuss salary benefits, onboarding and things like that. For those that don't quite make the cut, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be a fit for a future role. So I do tell people that if you don't get hired always ask the person who interviewed you, could you give me some constructive feedback? A lot of us are scared to do that. We don't want to hear what we do wrong because we just don't like to hear it. But that's going to stunt your growth. If you know what you did wrong in an interview or what gaps you need filled, hearing that information is really just going to make you a better person and uh, make you a better qualified candidate for the next time you're up. That's some great, great advice. And Rachel, I, I, I agree with you. I love it whenever we have hiring managers on here because we talk to so many recruiters and the hiring manager for a lot of job seekers is this mystical person that they they never know who that person really is. So to see it and hear about it from that perspective is great, Chad. Something else you've shared with us in the in the uh, pre calls there was about some different anecdotes, some cool stories. Uh, one of which had to do with some networking things and like a, a good referral story you had from somebody getting referred to you. From my eight plus years working overseas, I've worked alongside a lot of service members and kept in touch with the ones that really stood out. Of course, you have the ones that don't and then the ones that do. And through social media or email, uh, I keep in touch with them. Uh, recently, I had one of them reach out to me and say, hey, I applied for this job in Port Hwainimi and I don't think the interview went so well. And mm -hmm. I asked him, you know, what's your current background? What's your level of experience? Do you think you're really qualified for this role? And he said, yeah, I just haven't had the opportunity to work on certain things that they asked me about. And I said, okay, you know, this guy was ex an exceptional sailor. He was always in our hip pocket anytime we worked on a system, taking notes, and he was a very quick learner. So the job he applied for was outside of my business unit. I reached out to HR. Uh, HR connected me to the hiring manager. Uh, it was actually part of our national security programs. And I said, listen, you know, you probably don't know me. I'm the program manager for XYZ, but I know you recently interviewed this candidate and I just wanted to let you know, I would not be doing him justice if I sat here quietly. I need to let you know that he was an exceptional sailor. His technical interview may not have gone exceptionally well, but I will let you know that if I could have him on my team today, I would. He's just not in this area. So if you could extend him another opportunity or give him another interview and keep that in mind, I think he would do really well. He actually got hired. He texted me last week, uh, waiting for his polygraph, and he's actually, you know, onboarding with the program today. Man, that is a, such a great story. We always tell people, you know, you need to be more than just a more than just a resume. You need to be a, a name. And obviously, that sailor, like you said, impressed you when you were working face to face with him, um, and that that really carried through. I think you had another story, an Oconus hiring story. Yeah. So we had an applicant. You know, he has about thirty years of engineering background. And he's one of those types that would fly in, fix something and fly out. I think he did a lot of stuff with the spec ops teams, but he'd been outside the workforce for a while, uh, semi-retired. He's living in the Mideast. He has a house out there, applied for a position in Rota, Spain, and didn't quite make the cut due to lacking recent experience, but he was very communicative. Uh, he accepted the feedback we gave him and he kept in touch. And I really liked him because he maintained a positive attitude. Uh, he didn't try to force his way in, but he said, I understand, you know, if there's anything else that you think fits my resume or I would fit, then I would love to join your team elsewhere. Fast forward about six months, we had another position open in the same country where he resides. And we, we reached out and said, hey, are you interested? He said, yeah. Uh, so we actually hired him about two weeks ago and he's onboarding right now, uh, really looking forward for him to join the team. So between those two examples, it's not just the network, but really how you interact with other people, mm -hmm. how you carry yourself. You never know who's observing you. If you're goofing off or you're not really engaged or trying, people are going to remember that. So just definitely keep that in mind. Uh, before you look for the next career move, it might be five years down the line. Uh, you want to set yourself up for success today. You are just so full of great advice. I love it. I love story time. I love great advice. And I'm going to ask one more time for some more great advice from you, but would really appreciate on behalf of all of our wonderful listeners, you know, just really some advice that you would give for a cleared professional as they look to take that next step in their career. Is there just anything that you could boil it down to, to say, Hey, this is what's necessary to really kind of help move you in that direction. It might sound cliche, but I would say start with goals, uh, set realistic goals for yourself and try to really take time to think about what you enjoy doing. Do you enjoy working with people? 
a lot of people say no, they just want to fix technical problems. And that's fine, too. We need people doing ordinary and extraordinary things. Um, but once you know kind of what you enjoy doing, you got to set goals. If you know what the next career move for you, whether it's a project manager or just a technical lead, you can always look up those titles uh, on a job search and you know, go to our career portal. Uh, what does a project manager need? What are the requirements? And if you find what the gaps are in your resume, fill those gaps, uh, get qualified, uh, spend a little bit of time after work watching YouTube videos on how to fix something. 90% of that is all in your control. And it is up to you to be your biggest advocate, uh, your biggest cheerleader to really set yourself up for the future. That, that's great advice. Everything's been great, Chad. Uh, before we let it let you go, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Is it, can they just hit you up on LinkedIn? What's the best way for, for one of our great listeners to, to hit you up? They can find me on LinkedIn or they can hit my email if they're interested in SkillBridge or something like that, uh, chad.clary at gov2x.com. Outstanding. Well, Chad, it was an absolute pleasure getting to chat with you today to get to hear things from the other side of the table, the hiring manager and program leader. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Well, that was an awful lot of fun getting to talk to Chad today, and he just had so many great stories, so many great ideas, and even more importantly, just some fantastic advice. Something I really enjoyed was really just talking about the authenticity, you know, just very aware of the different pieces that are added in the resume and how you can speak to those. Bob, I know you enjoyed it. What did you enjoy in particular? thought it was neat that they don't just value soft skills, but they continue to teach soft skills. They continue to mentor soft skills, and they had some great uh, opportunities for development uh, to keep things moving in the right direction. I thought that was a pretty cool thing, and it was you could really sense how proud he was of the organization he's working with. I agree, and I, I definitely would add in there, I loved how he said they're part of the strategy, which is so exciting and such a good way to look at those new hires there. So you know what, friends? This brings us to the end. Make sure you get out there and follow our show. And we will talk to you and you and even you next week.